Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Williams. I'm the uh, chef over at Grace Hopper here in Cambridge. Um, and I am pleased to introduce to you um, a local chef um, here in Boston, um, a restaurateur, um, recently named um, Time's Most Influential People, um, 2017. Um, the pride of South Boston, I would, I would can easily say that. Um, and author of her new memoir, um, Out of Line, A Life of Playing with Fire. Uh, please welcome Chef Barbara Lynch to Talks at Google. Thanks, Andrew. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for uh, waiting. I'm a shitty driver. <laughs> I think it's time to get a driver. <laughs> Got a speeding ticket this this trip. So. All good. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read a little excerpt when I opened Montan, which was uh, just about 10 years ago. Um, as 2009 wore on. I was getting anxious to open Montan. It's too soon, people kept telling me. But I noticed that <clears throat> but I noticed that Boston, like every other city in the country, is full of steakhouses where it costs as much to eat hunks of meat from huge commercial feedlots, plain old baked potatoes and iceberg lettuce, while drinking ordinary booze and wine at sky high markups. As it might cost to dine at Montan, of course, some steakhouses are special, but often you pay top dollar for a meal you could easily make at home on the, bar on the backyard grill. Compare, compare that typical steakhouse meal with a fine dining experience, with food that awakens your palate, paired with expertly cho chosen wines, delivered through flawless service, which is more worth the price. During the recession, the steakhouses, the steakhouses didn't go broke, because people always need a place where they can celebrate with food. They might be too intimidated to choose a high-end restaurant, fearing, fearing a stuffy atmosphere, snooty service, or food that's too fancy or weird. I understand that, which is why we need warm, unpretentious places where people can discover and delight in the new. I wanted Montan to be one of those places, a welcoming setting with stimulating food. And I also felt a sense of responsibility to Boston. <clears throat> a world class has restaurants where innovation is always going on. They're an essential part of the, culture lands the cultural landscape. It was a sin that we'd lost so many. And young chefs need kitchens where they can observe and start to experiment with flavors while stretching their techniques beyond bistro food. When I announced the launch in December, the Blo Boston Glo Globe wondered if I was doomed. In a piece called The Gambler in the Kitchen, Bella English ticked off some reasons why. I was launching an ultra-lavish restaurant in a weak economy that has shuttered other upscale establishments in the middle of winter, normally an off time in the industry. And in the Four Point Channel neighborhood, an area that has yet to truly take off commercially. The upshot, this time she's defying convention as never before. But I went ahead and I pulled the trigger. Montan opened in spring 2010. In April, the Globe gave us a housewarming gift that still gives me a shiver of joy. A two-page review, a rave review in its Sunday magazine. Dever first, the, the reviewer praised, the ravioli stuffed with fava leaf, truffles flung about like rose petals at a wedding, foie gras terrine richness punctuated by sweet wine jelly, <laughs> Squiggles of rhubarb gel cavort exuberantly on the plate. <laughs> Such a writer. <clears throat> a pea velouté, the color of Kermit, pools around candy colors, tiny pink radishes, bright carrots, asparagus tips, elfin mushrooms, spiced with wisps of curry yogurt, fat langoustines with blunt pink tails wrapped in shredded phyllo dough. Wow, she, she really did <laughs> like it. It was downright poetic. A pool quote read, a menu offering maximum pleasure, and that was my goal, exactly what I wanted to achieve. One paragraph that grabbed m me discussed the controversy about the opening, whether it was arrogant to open an expensive high-end restaurant in tough times. Deborah first didn't think so and credited the nerve it took. 
Chef Barbara Lynch, she wrote, has canals of steel. <laughs> uh, canals of steel. Men have balls of steel. But how do you say that a woman is bold for a chef? What expression could be better? I'd like, I'd like she had canals of steel to be my epitaph. Mm. Montan would be listed in the best restaurant roundups in Bon Appetit and End in Esquire and be nominated for the best new restaurant at the 2011 James Beard Awards. Then, amazingly, the restaurant was included into Relais and Chateau, the prestigious international consortium of gourmet restaurants and boutique hotels. Sophisticated travelers pay a substantial fee to join in order to ensure that wherever they are, they can enjoy the finest quality accommodations and meals. Restaurants are admitted because of their innovative cuisine and outstanding service, confirmed by surprise visits of the 520 chefs scattered over five continents. Only 35 <clears throat> are in the United States. And I was the only one in Boston and one of the only six female chefs in the world. All I could say was, holy shit, I really fucking did it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Then I went out and I got the heaviest, most beautiful gold plaque I could find to hang out front with the Relais and Chateau designation in bold lettering. I could just hear my mother saying, Barbara, you better make sure no one steals that and what in God's name does it mean? <laughs> what if I told her it meant that I opened a world-renowned restaurant? Jesus Christ, what a story should say. Some kind of chateau, where the hell, just where the hell did you come from? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Beautiful. So you have seven restaurants in total, right? Well, eight now. Eight. Well, I just uh, partnered with uh, Mario Batali at Italy. Beautiful. It's my nice. first partnership. Great. It's going well, surprisingly. So. So how do you? How would you carve out like, or how do you carve out restaurant identities from the ones that you have? How do I carve out? Um, what do you mean? So like your experiences would create you, like you went, to Italy, you went to Italy when you were younger. Yeah. Is that Was that your reasoning for opening Sportella, that you wanted to have this counter bar? Uh, or, no, know? that was my experience at Brigham's when I was a kid. I uh, <clears throat> worked at Brigham's on Park Street. <laughs> so that, yeah, it's, it's the same formula as like the counter service. Yeah. So I was a waitress and, and a cook and like, a packer, you know, for the gallons of ice cream. And literally no one would show up for work, so I would like serve, flip grilled cheese or a burger, pour tea, and then make ice cream sundaes at the same time and cash out, like cashier. So yeah, that and that like formula is really fabulous. It really works. The butcher shop was my first trip to Italy. Uh, you could actually go up, it was in a little town called Tevedina. Uh, and the girl I worked with at Michaela's in Cambridge, right around here, mm -hmm. um, ha her parents had bought a house in the 70s, um, and she invited me to Italy, and that was actually my first trip, where you could go up the hill to this little bodega and buy, well, go to a wild boar butchering, buy your meats, uh, fill up bottles of wine, white or red, <clears throat> have a shot of Insanto, get your gas, buy your cigarettes, and then go to the market, or, you know, this, that's, a, that was the butcher shop. Nice. Uh, B&G Oysters is my Kelly's Landing experience in Southie. Uh, we'd always go to Kelly's Landing for fried clams and calamari. Uh, number nine was my experience from the St. Patolf Club. Uh, I used to be a server at the St. Patolf Club where my mother worked, private club. You know, like fine dining table, white tablecloth. Mm -hmm. Drink, uh, I always wanted a dive bar, but that's way too cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of a dive bar. Yeah, but. my brother used to own the Quiet Man Pub in Southie, across from Triple O's. Uh, Montan is my travels. Well, that was supposed to be my swan song, so uh, I guess that's not happening. Um, what else do I have? What else do I have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, stir. Stir. That's the same kitchen as my kitchen at home, but just a smaller version. With severe ADD, I just opened that because I knew I was opening three restaurants so I could cook in that kitchen, so I knew where everything was. And uh, 
I think I got it all. And they're all in Boston. Yeah. You haven't gone anywhere else. You haven't okay. taken your show to Vegas or. <clears throat> no. Is there a reason why? Is there a reason why you just want to stay in Boston or you? I'd feel... gamble too much. Uh, <laughs> well, Boston, first of all, I felt like it needed a like I. I knew what I wanted, and I didn't. And Boston didn't have it um, at the time, and I'm also like. I'm a community girl. I, I have to have a purpose, and uh, I love this city. So, part of history. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for staying. Well, well, Not thank taking you. your show anywhere thank else. Thank you for being here. I you mean, know? this is great. So, is there a distinctive Barbara Lynch style of food? I would. Yeah, I would think so. I think it's like fucked up Italian French. <laughs> <laughs> I always say it's like, uh, geez, I think it's like. Italian, like twisted, uh, or classical European food with a f with a flair, right? So, like like Italians would never put foie gras in a ravioli. That's just way too out of the box for them. Uh, and the French really don't go out of the box either. So they're very generation, generation, mm -hmm. generation. So it's just uh, my take on their classics. Did your Southie background and your, you know. Your rebellionous kind of ways kind of lead to that. You could call it a shortcut kid kind of style. Shortcut kid kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know that you're you're really big in education. Yeah. You didn't graduate high school. You didn't finish high school. No, they want. I I was like two points shy of graduating. Plus it was the height of uh, force busing. So um, I was a really terrible student <clears throat> in high school, but a young entrepreneur in high school. <laughs> I pretty much uh, was a bookie in high school, and I, <laughs> I knew how to make money at a young age. So my mom put me in a yeah, parochial school that had just started because of the forced busing era, um, and I wasn't doing so well. And so the second year, she pulled me out, and I got bused to Madison Park High, which was really chaotic. It was like a war zone. Mm -hmm. So I would skip out usually at 10 and uh, probably sold some marijuana maybe, I don't know. It happens. Uh, <laughs> and so I had, a lot of ha I had a lot of time on my hands and I was pretty creative from 10 o'clock on. Um, and then my, I got, had a really great home ec teacher <clears throat> and uh, she went, saw like a uh, talent in me. So she went to my guidance counselor and said, if this kid doesn't take cooking for four years, then she, she won't even stay in school. And uh, so I literally stayed in school for four years. But those two points shy, they wanted me to come back and go to summer school, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I am way too busy for summer school. But oh. later on, when I, when I started to get accolades, uh, like as a chef, um, the headmaster, uh, Tom Hennessy, came by with Gilardi, and who was the guidance counselor, and, gave me my diploma, so I was pretty lucky. <laughs> um, so you have a daughter. I do. I have a daughter. Um, How old? She's eight. Uh -huh. She's um, she's crazy, um, as all eight-year-olds can be. Mine's 13, and it's, oof. So I have up, five years. Up and down, up and down. Um, what do you teach your daughter about food, and, and you know, and I guess in school and, and in, in life? I mean. She teaches me, are you kidding? She's like the toughest critic. She's been telling me since four, like, mom, you don't even know how to cook popcorn right. <laughs> she like puts the like posted sticker, a sticker on the microwave and she points the arrow to the popcorn like button. And I was like, oh, is this how it is? <laughs> and like gently she'll take the pasta bowl and walks over to the sink and just smiles at me and then empties out the water, which means it's too much water in the pasta, or it's too she much oil. She teaches you how to do pasta. Huh? She teaches you how to do pasta. Well, I mean, she'll just gently tell me how much she doesn't like it right now. <laughs> but she can, she can fillet a salmon, she can, she makes the 45 minute scrambled eggs, she can, like, you know, she knows how to, we go clamming, she can scrub clams, steam them. No fear. Mm -mm, That's no. good. That's a good thing to have. No. Um, what about <clears throat> as far as teaching her about, you know, how how 
like the farm to table movement is a big thing and how you know we use our you know how we use our resources yeah as far as like locally and as far as you know you know trying to how we treat the earth and how how that upbringing you know how you as a chef yeah could teach her like how do you incorporate, do you incorporate any of that with her or? yeah yeah she's taught that in school now and actually i put her into a farm school uh during the summer vacation uh it's called white lock farm in winchester mm. she loves it so she's uh, she knows more about composting than i do and recycling and uh, you know so we're on it farm to table yeah she she knows it hmm. well my best friend's Anna Sortorn, so we vacation all summer and Anna's really earthy crunchy and you know i mean that's how we live so yeah yeah Nice. Yeah. And Anna, Anna Sortoon, she wrote oh. a mm. forward oh, in yeah. book? Oh, she did, yeah. She did. <laughs> and she wrote a quote on the back. Yeah. Too, yeah. So how did, how did that, like, how, how did your relationship with her come about? I mean, it's, oh. you, know, you, you had a lot of great people write forwards for you on your book. Yeah, Yotam, you know? too, yeah. And, you know, I think it's great that you had her being from Cambridge or, you know, yeah. around you, here. You know, Anna, Anna started cooking at the... It's no longer here, but at the Trident Bookstore Cafe on Newberry Street. How old are you? I'm 38. I would, oh, you I wouldn't even know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at the Trident Bookstore Cafe, I think is now like Stephanie's on Newberry. Um, and I didn't even know. I didn't know Anna then, <clears throat> but I had just started cooking. But it was a place I used to go for lunch because I knew I could have like a bowl of soup and read cookbooks at the same time. I was like, fuck, this is delicious food. Um, and then um, she started working at Casablanca in Cambridge. Hmm. And I, I was working at the Harvest. And so then, uh, and then we met. And she was like all of like 20 and I was 21. So we have been friends for 30 years. Hmm. And then we used to vacation together in Westport, Mass with Isan and uh, Steve Johnson and uh, Kat Saleri and a guy called... Uh, Charlie Robinson, who used to own Eat in Cambridge. And we vacationed for like 12 years, Westport, same house. And now we vacation in Truro, and her daughter's a year younger than mine. And now they just Facebook each other all. <laughs> it's better than play date, because she lives in Sudbury, and I live in uh, Winchester, Gloucester kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, and she teaches me about spices, and I teach her how to make pasta. She teaches you about spices? Yeah. Yeah. She is. She's like the mayor the of East queen, Istanbul. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you should go to Turkey with her sometime. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this book that you just you've just written. Yeah. <clears throat> um, why now? I mean, it you, seems like you have so much going on, like with all your your restaurants, your, you know, all your your yeah. individual things you have going on, and and then to stop and write a book, and and this book. Yeah, like, it, it actually why? took like five years. But, um, you know, I had to Google it to, uh, like, what's a memoir? Oh, my God. Like, I did not want to write this. Because, I, first of all, I felt too young to write this. And then what comes after this? Like, the Lifetime Achievement Award? Or? But, um, I, I, and I never had an agent before, but this woman from New York read about um, a story that was written about me in the business section of the New York Times about five years ago. And she, man, did she hound me like to write a book because I have a story to tell and it would be very uh, powerful and inspirational for other people. Not just women, but for, for underprivileged and just for people in general to, you can do anything you want if you want it. And so she talked me into it and, and then here it is. And you know what? I think the timing is actually perfect right now with the way the world is. and So it is good timing. Hmm. And it's doing great. Excellent. Yeah. And, I mean, what do you hope your readers will take away from it? I mean, what do you want them to, oh. what do you want them to see? Um, you know, I want, them, I want them to know that they can do anything they want. I want them to f be inspired that if I can do this with zero education and a uh, pretty really humble upbringing, then they can do it. Not just open a restaurant, but they can, they can do anything they want. Have you, have you gotten over your insecurities? No, but most of them, yeah. 
Now, I'm kind of happy who I am now. Hmm. I'm pretty confident, more confident. Tougher. Tougher than before? And gentler oh. at the same time. I, see, I can see how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Tough when you have to be. I'm smarter, put it that way. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, when I say I'm more confident, I guess I'm more, like now I love business part too. Like, I'm confident in cooking. I mean, there's, you know, I got it. Yeah, I can't see how you'd have any insecurities from, from what, well, I, that's what, you from what I've seen over your Yeah, yeah, your I years. come across as really tough, but I'm, man, I'm a, like a teddy bear. Really? Yeah. Oh, I was, I was scared. I got a heart. <laughs> In your book, you talk about cooking as the drama of creation, even a miracle in the making. Can you describe a recent miracle in your kitchen, in one of your kitchens, or in the kitchen, oh. whatever you call your kitchen? I say a miracle is like, you know, when you kind of create a di invent a dish, like, because food's already been invented, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not really into molecular, but... Um, you know, like a dish like a prune stuffed gnocchi has never been made before that I know of. You can't. I've never seen it before. Right, you can't find it in a recipe book except for mine or... I've tried to copy it. You did? I did. How'd it go? Sorry. That's fine. I'm flat. Not, not too late. <laughs> <laughs> I used a little... Yeah, I used I used, put prunes in a, in a dish once. Cool. Pasta dish. And I was, you know... How'd it go? Um, I thought it was okay. It definitely was not number nine park. Where but that's okay. But I tried, you know. But that's that's your dish. Yeah, I mean, but it was definitely you were definitely inspired me to to go out and you know try different things. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's that's good. Um, and then the butter soup at Montan is, you know, just butter. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and shellfish and uh, milk and honey. But I don't think anybody made butter soup before either. So. Um, but it's good butter. It's like 87% butter. Wow. Fat, butter fat. <laughs> uh, but we have cows in Vermont, and uh, she's absolutely brilliant, and um, uh, it's the way she feeds the cows. So wild flowers and hops and, um, you know. And you have your own cow. Well, we lease the cows, and uh, it's the most expensive butter ever. <laughs> <laughs> She makes butter for me and Thomas Keller. I think we're the crazy chefs that will do it. But it's also supporting a farmer. Yeah. She's definitely. a one woman show. So. Yeah, that's a great thing. Yeah. I mean, that's She's a great thing. Amazing. She's up in Orwell, Vermont. Orwell, Vermont. Animal Farm. Hmm. Diane St. Clair. I will look her up. She makes amazing buttermilk, too. It, probably really expensive buttermilk. Probably. <laughs> But she's, uh, you know, she's always growing and experimenting, and finally she, she's got some help. Um, she trusts somebody to help her make cheese. So she's starting to make cheese and more things. She loves her cows. And it shows in the butter. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're gonna just turn it into a butter soup. Mm -hmm. Looks interesting on the P&Ls, like cows. <laughs> <laughs> Chefs on TV yeah. and the public fascination with this I mean, do you? Well, I think is it something you on like trying is, what, to what's the show Chef's Table or something? I think that's is that a, like a uh, the history of a chef. I, I don't I don't really watch it, but um, I mean the good and the bad. The good thing is that there's an audience out there. Like the reality shows are uh, crazy, but there is an audience out there that watches it. The the sh the I just wish that. Uh, there were more shows that are teaching um, people how to cook instead of judging them how to cook um, because of the audience and, and you would learn a lot more, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. Um, what I find fascinating is the age group that is actually cooking, which is the 13, 14 year olds that want to cook and want to learn how to cook. I mean, my daughter and her group of friends are just friggin' like crazy. They're doing their own top chefs in the kitchen, and which I don't stop it because although they make a mess, it's like, wow, they're just experimenting. I mean, I, and they're making cakes and they're just crazy in the kitchen. That is a good thing, um, which if somebody was, if there were better shows that were really 
kind of fun and like a Julia Child cooking mm -hmm. show again would be amazing mm -hmm. from beginning to end would Instead be great. Of just, you know, yeah, like on potato on five on ways on or, you know, the basics and knife skills would be amazing from consomme to stocks, et cetera. It would be a, it would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. but then we wouldn't be held captive by packaged foods and perhaps we wouldn't be obese if we taught more cooking healthy. Well, there's your next job. I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a really good teacher, but I mean, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I see it. You do? I do. Maybe me and you? That'd be nice. All right, let's yeah. do it. <laughs> um, Hi, so, <laughs> uh, we're going to open up Q&A. Um, if anybody has a question. Uh, hi, Barbara. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. Thanks uh, for waiting. The, um, you, I, earlier you said you're uh, tougher, kinder, smarter. Tougher, oh, kinder, smarter. Right, all at once. Yeah. Do you have any um, um, inspiration, people who have inspired you in terms of your management style, um, either inside or outside of your industry that maybe you've read about or that you've met with who have helped you become smarter? Yeah, but I forget his name. He used to run the LA Lakers. I, Jerry, Jerry Buss? Jerry Buss. Uh, was there another one before that? Jerry West. Jerry Buss. I think so. OK, why? <laughs> tell us why. Well, he was a team player. Like, he, he wasn't just the coach. Like, he really inspired. Oh, Pat Riley. Pat Riley, yeah. yeah. OK. So when I first started cooking, I, I don't know why, but I loved him. And I loved the way he was a coach. Um, like, he was just part of the team. And um, that really inspired me for my first, I want to say my first five restaurants. Um, and then um, I think, and then it was more about uh, kind of like feeding the masses, right? So y you can't really um, be snobbish about what you want and what you want to cook. You have to feed what the public wants, throw a little bit of cre creativity in it so you can get the world in, um, and then you'll shine. You know, you have, I mean, honestly, I could eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich every day, but I love the craft of cooking. I'm not a foodie foodie, but I love the, I love the process of cooking. So, um, so uh, there's another book that I read b about um, creativity um, and how to survive it and how to be successful at it. I forget the name of the book though. Uh, management style, probably Danny Meyer too. Table talk. Uh, you mentioned. Um Teaching people to cook and things like knife skills. What other stuff like knife skills should people learn who want to actually learn how to cook? Uh, at home, yeah. too? Yeah. Sharpening stones. Like, you know, do you have a sharpening stone at home, anyone? Like the wet stones? Like, yeah, I, I would say just take time. It's really therapeutic, actually, if you use a wet stone. And it usually takes about a half an hour, a knife. Um, but there are, you know, you can go, you can YouTube it and Google it and they'll show you how to do it. Because I think if your knife is really sharp, it, it takes about a second to chop a carrot. But if you don't, it, it really is like torture. Um, I think knife skills and really prepping ahead, mise en place is, is key. And then cooking so easy after that. And I'm a huge induction fan. I don't know if anybody has induction. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Fast, clean, really clean, holds temperatures, and it's just awesome. But teaching to cook is like, I guess once you get the basics down, then you can just fly through it. And also, use your fridge. Clean out your fridge and just use it up. And uh, one-pot wonders are always fun, too. Like, just be creative. Hey, um, I was wondering, what do you think has been more a part of you, being a chef or being an entrepreneur? Chef first. Always. Entrepreneur was crazy. <laughs> I think I remember when somebody said she's a serial entrepreneur, I had to Google that. I was like, wow, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> but now I like being an entrepreneur because it just um, it creates more jobs within, and I love to see the staff. It's also fun to set them up for success. 
it makes me feel like a grandmother, but it's also really fun to see them succeed. Um, it's also fun to see some come back when they think that when they leave too soon, and then they come back. Um, and we're and as we grow, we're going to go through another really big growth spurt, which is going to be exciting. Um, <clears throat> and this time we might go global, so even better. Um, so yeah, it's um, entrepreneurship now. I mean, now I'm ready for it. You know, before I wasn't. And before I wasn't ready to be a chef chef either. So you learn, you know, I've been cooking for 32 plus years. So now I, you know, you go through that experiment stage and too much shit on a plate. Now it's just like, oof, perfection, you know? And I'll never be like happy with, with what I'm cooking. I'll always learn, always learning. But I know I'm not, I know I don't, I know I don't want molecular in my life. <laughs> I just, just don't. Like I love textures. I love, you know. Have you considered? Sorry, have you considered going outside your sort of wheelhouse of French and Italian? At home, I do. Yeah, I'm um, Burmese. I uh, love Thai. I love uh, Middle Eastern. Yeah. But I, I, I don't want a restaurant like that because that's just not, because I'll always fall back on Italian and French. Yeah. I love cooking Indian food. Oh my God, you know. It's all about the pantry, really. If you have all the ingredients, that's so fun. But, but, I, but I know I'll always go back. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, biggest differences in uh, what you learned or experienced in business as between your first restaurant and your last restaurant. How hard was it to launch as a non-brand compared to launching now as a brand? Hmm. It got a little easier. It just got more expensive. I'm going to talk about like the development-wise or um, real estate. Um, Brand-wise, you know, I had to like realize that I'm the brand, and I think that was really hard. I think it's hard to realize that Barbara Lynch was the brand, and it was also hard to convince uh, my operations manager that it's ridiculous to try to brand a single restaurant as, say, like Stir, and then try to brand that the chef who's running stir. Because, you know, after being open for 12 years, like, Barbara Lynch's stir would go a lot farther than just stir. So we are actually rebranding the whole brand now. Instead of, like, Barbara Lynch Grupo, it'll be, like, just Barbara Lynch's stir, Barbara Lynch's Nine Park, Barbara Lynch's Montan. Because believe it or not, like, a lot of people can eat at the restaurants and really have no idea that I own all of the restaurants. So it's, it's kind of important to kind of really look at it every five years and make sure that from afar, like step back and kind of look at the brand again and make sure it's right. Like I had a catering company called Niche Couture. That was awful. Like, <laughs> like the phone call. Nikki Katori, like, oh my God, what did I do? Um, and then Nine at Home uh, was actually much better because they knew Number Nine, so Number Nine at Home was a was a hit. Although I still, I did, I kind of put that one to sleep because it was a, it was tough to run a catering company that was, um, you know, most of the catering companies are already grandfathered in, and uh, hard to run a catering company if you don't have like a huge commissary and catering uh, China glassware silver and a huge warehouse with all the rental equipment because it's too costly. Another little you learn from your mistakes kind of thing. Uh, so I wanna, since you've got a room full of, of geeks here at Google. I, I wanna, love geeks. I yeah, so, so I wanna push you on this molecular thing a little bit because I, I like to cook but I also not big on foams or making spheres or stuff like that but if I'm making jam, I'll still pick up Terrence McGee on food and cooking and look at how the proteins bind and a little acid helps. And so, you know, and I like my sous vide. So, so 
aside from the I love my cryovac machine. No, yeah. I well, do. so that's the, so the question is: Do you still appreciate? There has been this huge trend in science and cooking and understanding the science of food and what's happening, which I think has made cooking a lot better. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you sort of learn from that and take from that, or do you still go by gut and instincts and what's worked and and history, or do you? Yeah. Well, I'm not saying the science. Of, I love like the process of uh, putting vinegar in water or, you know, for quail eggs, blah, 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 or, you know, why you put vinegar to poach an egg. I love that process of the science, yeah. I don't like adding, uh, uh, what the hell, like, uh, you don't glue, you, you don't glue your meat? Maltodextrins, everything? Maltodextrins, no, I don't. Exactly. I, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't like the shit that goes on my tongue or the way it feels on my tongue. I just don't, I don't, I don't like that. And I'm kind of over the noma plating of every dish that like everyone looks the same in that plating world. That's just me. Like we have a round plate and everybody plates a little bit on the edge. It just fucking gets me mad. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> What, can we go back to the masters? Why, like, you know, Jean-Louis Paladin even, like, go back and, and plate real food, maybe. Try? I, yeah, that's just me, but, um, and I'm not knocking it, because it's just, it would take me another 50 years to learn how to cook that way, and I love Harry McGee. I love him and Wiley Dufresne, and I'm not knocking it at all. It's just, it, you know, it takes, it takes about five years to kind of come up with a dish that actually works that way. And it's not, it's already been invented by NASA anyway. It's, it's like you're taking chemicals and everything that they've invented and trying, to, and trying to put a dish together that will actually work. That's torture, man. That would, you know, that's like a mad scientist trying to invent something. I don't, I don't know. Let's spend some of that time trying to make healthier food for kids, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of like hard for me to wrap my head around it. Cool. But I love science. So I don't know. It's just not me. Awesome. I'd run out of time. Thanks. <laughs> Sounds like you're not into see how tall you can make your dishes on the plate as well, which is that, there was that period. By using the most expensive Bernardo china? No, I'm, uh, I'm all right with that. <laughs> When we talked about the difference between you as a chef and an entrepreneur, would you say as an entrepreneur, do you have a vision like, okay, five years, 10 years, I want X, or are the new restaurants a little bit more just like, okay, inspiration, I need this? Uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm, I, I'm working on a new, I, I mean, this formula for restaurants right now has to change. It's not gonna survive. But, so yeah, I'm working on a new, sort of idea of what a restaurant formula would look like. Self-sustainable restaurant. Like you might have to have a whole building where indoor gardening, slaughterhouse, uh, retail, like a small eatery basically, but also your staff, apartments upstairs, you know, uh, stay, eat and shop kind of thing, mm. that kind of thing or little mi mini agro turismos, who knows? It's gonna change, it can't, it can't sustain it this way. Or maybe, you know, malls are declining, maybe malls become the new farmer's market, so I don't, it's gonna, you know. But that's okay, because it's evolution, right? So we, things are gonna change, it's gonna change. I love change, and I love entrepreneurship too. So, online banking for women or underprivileged you know, like, let's get them started. I don't know. You've got seven, no, eight restaurants. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting more. How much do you actually get to cook and where? Good question. Um, there's really no room in the kitchen because of the chain of command and if I'm in there and get pulled away, if I start changing menus on the line and get pulled away for other projects, it's just a shit show. So I mentor the chefs um, at home. So I have them come up like on a Tuesday and I have a million cookbooks. So I get to hang out with one from each restaurant alone. Uh, we pretty much will read cookbooks all day and I'll either cook with them or we'll go out to dinner. We'll go fishing, we'll go to the farmer's market or we'll go to certain farms that I like. 
Um, and then the next day, we'll generally cook for 10 random people. And then we hang out again the next day and we'll chit chat more. And I get to really know them, like uh, heart and soul. And, and then we will do it a few more times from each restaurant. And that way, I get a lot more out of it. I get to see how they cook um, and where they want to go next within the company or without, you know, what are their goals. And it's, it's a much better way to cook with them that way. I still love cooking. I, I, and I actually entertain a lot at home, but my limit is six people. Six to eight is the most to have, uh, I'd like to have good conversations. So I limit my china and silverware. I don't want to have any more than that, usually. 10 is the top, but that's just for like <laughs> that dinner part, like that part of the dinner. I'm, am I making sense? That's when we <laughs> invite the 10 people over, max. I'm picky like that. Good rule. Yeah? Yeah. Do you like to cook at home? Um, I, I do. I do. I'm, I'm sort of, you know. Busy? A little bit, but, you know, also handcuffed. Uh, my wife is a big nutritional oh. fan, so a lot of quinoas and farros and stuff like that and keep it simple. And yeah. But I do. I love to cook at home. But I'm going to start throwing out my silverware now. <laughs> like, I don't have enough. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, question? Uh, you mentioned having uh, humble upbringings and then having a lot of success. Did you have to overcome any guilt because of that? Um, if that makes sense at all. Like guilt? Like, I've always felt like I was a shortcut kid or how did I get here? Like, yeah. oh my God, yeah. Um, yeah, I still feel a little shocked. Um, I don't really look at it anymore. Like, like if I, if I didn't really look at what I've done up until now, but now I look at it and go, oh my god, I guess I've really done a lot. Like with the rest, like a lot of restaurants. And this whole time thing, uh, I was like, shit. An Uber guy said, holy cow, like there's 70 billion people in the or seven billion people in the world. I was like, oh God, don't tell me that. I really like my world, my really small world. <laughs> so um, I can't think of, uh, you know, I, I don't think about it like that. I, I, I think I still am in a tunnel vision world. And I kind of like it. But um, I'm not done yet, so I guess that's it. I don't feel guilty as much anymore. I feel like um, more confident. Because I used to have those carrots that I used to go after. Like, I always wanted to be uh, Joelle Rubichon or Elaine Ducasse. And finally, like, finally, I think at age 50, I said, I'm really happy to be Barbara Lynch. So that's when you know you're happy, but I'm not done. So, I, yeah. So that's good. Good to be not done yet. I haven't learned enough yet. So I love learning more, if that makes sense. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Oh, my, thank you. Um, so as you've risen and kind of expanded in your career and in Boston, what are some of the hardest roles and jobs you've had to give up to others or relinquish, right, to your team and yourself? Oh, I think the hardest was stepping out of the kitchen. Like, I think I felt like a year, I was like, I floundered for a year. Like, that's when I felt the guiltiest, like leaving the kitchen and still wearing a chef's coat and like just walking around and feeling useless. When I say like there is no room on the line, there were times that I jumped in on the line and would send somebody out, get off the line. Uh, and, and you know, it just kind of causes a lot of chaos and stuff. But believe me, I did it. And I will do it if I still feel like this, if anyone's literally not cooking correctly. Um, but I think, you know, that's just letting go. You have to let go and, and delegate. That's when you gotta really find your voice and be tougher, is that's when you gotta really, like, find that voice to say, oh my God, well, how many f times do I fucking tell you, like, Jesus, like, I hate mescaline, <laughs> you know, like, mescaline salad. I didn't, 
<laughs> can, there are vegetable salads you can, you know, that is when you have to say, third time, I'm not saying it again, you know. Or, because I still do the menus with the chefs, and uh, now I draw them and paint them and write it out. And what part of that did you not understand? You know, that, then you, you gotta get tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher. Um, and that took a few years. So I think that was the toughest challenge for me, to, to really f switch that position. But you have to do it if you wanna grow and you have to delegate, and that's when you have to get tough. So that was, that was the tough part. And accepted that you are a businesswoman as well chef owner slash businesswoman. But the chef owner comes first and then businesswoman. And you have to remember it. Great. So. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. My God, thank you. Thank Here. you. Thanks, great questions. <laughs>